decisions. Freedom by Gary Owen. And did thou speak in ancient time? Walk upon For a long while now, we've been hearing a lot about protecting people's feelings. And that sounds like a good thing. It is a good thing. But when we look at what's been happening, it seems as though only some people's feelings count. Only some people get to have their feelings protected. Only some people get not to be offended. And that's not fair. And it's going to have to change. And was Jerusalem builded here? My best friend when I was 18, 19 was a girl called Lee, Lee with a GH. Me and Lee would look at our mums, our exhausted, stressed out mums who did everything for us and say, no way. That is not us. We are never, never having kids. We were going to be brilliant, strong women and go out there and make the world a better place. Of course, then Lee, because she was a bit of a flaky cow, got up the duff. And because she had a nice boyfriend who said he'd do everything, she went, yeah, all right, and decided to keep it. And then she had a little girl called Rosie. And Rosie... <laughs> Rosie was so, so beautiful and I fell in love with her completely. And not long after, I got up the duff too. And even though I didn't have a nice boyfriend, I decided to keep her. I would have a beautiful baby daughter and raise her to be a brilliant, strong woman, and she would go out there and make the world a better place. I wouldn't be able to, of course, because I'd be too tired and broken from raising a small human being. But I didn't get a beautiful baby daughter. I didn't get a girl. I got Jamie. Hello? OK. I'm Jamie. Jamie Williams. And it's just Jamie, not James. It's not short for anything. I don't even know where to start. What you realise, once you've actually got a kid, is that you love them far too much to want them to be like you. Cos what you see in them is all the things you do wrong. You try to set an example, but what they pick up on are your flaws and your weaknesses. You don't want a mini-me. You don't want a clone. When you have a kid, all you want is for them to be happy. And you'll give anything, do anything you can for them to be happy. Whatever it costs. I'm Jamie Williams. And I'm here to talk about what my mum did to me. It was, I think, June 2018, and Jamie was having his first ever girlfriend round for tea. Lovely. And she was a lovely girl, called Becca. Mum? What? You're not going to embarrass me, are you? I think that's my job. It's always going to be a weird moment when your little boy brings his first ever girlfriend home. But it turned out weirder than I expected, because... By the time Jamie brought Becca home, I knew for a fact that my little boy was gay. I didn't always know. What does it mean for a two-year-old to be gay? I remember him fighting another kid for the Snow White dress, a soft play one time, but the kid he was fighting was a boy too. Because all the little boys love that Snow White dress. And they all look great in it. <laughs> so you can't really read anything into that, but... As they grow up, you get hints, and Jamie dropped quite big hints. Mum, you know Corey B is my best friend in the world? I do. Can I marry him when I grow up? Of course you can. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure, darling. Because Louisa said I can't. Well, Louisa doesn't know what she's talking about. If I marry a boy, can we have babies? Because that's what I want to do. No, my darling. I want to be a daddy. And you're going to be a brilliant daddy. I know you are. Just not for a bit. 
Yeah, I invited all the kids in school with same-sex parents round for play dates in a bit of a cringy way. I wanted him to see there was nothing to panic about. It was like having blue eyes or brown eyes. It was just the way some people are. That's what I tried to show him. And doing that got more and more important after the freedom law. The eyes 311. The nose 298. The eyes have it. What happened was the government collapsed. A few dozen MPs refused to support the hard Brexit bill that had been negotiated with the EU, enough that the bill failed. The Prime Minister finally resigned. Politicians of all parties scrambled in new alliances to get some kind of government, any kind of government. It turned out it was the hard Brexiteers on the left and the right who could bear to come together. They formed a coalition of national unity, but unity came at a price. And one small party with a handful of seats extracted a very particular price. The Freedom Law. I think things are a little out of balance. We're giving people jail sentences for things they've said on Twitter. And let's be clear, not for threats, not for incitements to violence, those are very separate, but for opinions. Offensive opinions, yes, but people are going to prison for expressing these opinions. They're losing their jobs, their homes, often their families, for voicing an opinion. Do you think we persuade people they are wrong by shutting them up? No. We persuade people they are wrong by letting them express their opinions and arguing with them till they see the error of their ways. I remember the new Prime Minister on TV trying to explain it and I remember half thinking he might have a point. But even as I thought that, I wasn't sure. I mean... <laughs> In one moment, I find myself reading the story of some kid who'd ended up in jail for burglary after a lifetime of poverty and abuse and thinking, poor kid, what he needs is support, not prison. But then the same moment, I'd see some student get in jail for a nasty tweet. I'd be thinking, yeah, privileged little prick, bang him up, he deserves it. And then I find myself thinking, does he, though? Do I really think... Saying something offensive is worse than breaking into somebody's house. And I didn't quite know. I think, if anything, it's going to be very healthy for us. I didn't know what I thought. We're going to see democracy and civil society strengthened by a robust new conversation where everyone can say what they feel. I suppose that's why I wasn't out on the streets over the freedom law, because... I slightly wondered, if I'm honest, whether we had got a bit hysterical and, and because there were so many things to get angry about, you have to pick your battles. But that's good, isn't it? Letting people say what they think? It sounds like it is, yeah, but sometimes people think nasty things. I think nasty things all the time. <laughs> mostly about me. Yeah, not always. <laughs> but mostly. But if we stop people saying nasty things, they'll still think them, won't they? I suppose, but... Imagine you're thinking nasty things about me. If that stays in your head, what do I care? It's just when it comes out, it's going to upset me. And if Jamie was going to grow up in a world where saying even the most vicious, violent things was allowed, I had to make sure he grew up proud of himself and afraid of who he was. Prime Minister, I remember you saying worries about the freedom law were just another project fear. But here we are, one year in, and we've seen a, a clear rise in hate crime, even after you've taken most hate crime off the statute books. Well, I think this is just one of the positives of the freedom law. Now that the police aren't wasting their energy chasing people who've used naughty words online... They've got more time to fight actual hate crime, actual violence, actual intimidation. Right, so it's an increase in reporting. There's been no actual rise in violence against minorities. Once people see there's a point to reporting hate crime, then, of course, they're more likely to report it. But none of my efforts worked. Jamie was not proud. He saw graffiti on the walls, he heard people shouting on the streets, watched stories about attacks and assaults. He became very much afraid. 
which is how we ended up having tea with poor, sweet, endlessly perky Becca. What did you think of her? Well, she's lovely. What's that supposed to mean? I said she's lovely. Ah, what you said was, well, big paws, she's lovely. She is lovely. Yeah, I know. I'm just a bit surprised. About what? Just, I thought... OK, I always thought you liked boys. What? You do, don't you? You mean, what, like, like? You've always said that. You remember saying you wanted to marry Corey? We were talking about it'd be fun to live in the same house cos we could play Infinity all night. And I thought that's what it meant to be married to someone that you lived with them. I don't think that's oh, true. I know what I was thinking, Mum. I was inside my head. You weren't. That's really what you're telling me? Yes. Yes. And what you want for your child is... you want them to be happy. Well, in that case, I think Becca's great. <sighs> yeah, I think so too. It's just... She goes to this church in town. Lots of people do. Well, not a lot. And this church is a bit... A bit what? Happy clappy? Not like they really believe things. It's not just turn up and sing a few hymns and try and be nice to people. It's a bit more hardcore. In what sort of way, Liv? Well, she's not supposed to go out with anybody. You know. She's not supposed to have sex before marriage. Oh, <laughs> it's not just actual sex, it's... Like, maybe she's allowed to kiss under the mistletoe at Christmas. But that's it. And they believe in hell. Lakes of burning fire? Yeah. Like, if you're a sinner, you're tortured for all eternity after you die. There, God, sounds like a lovely chap. But it's not God, is it? It's us that does the sin. Jamie had found himself a way out. He didn't really like girls, but he didn't want to say he liked boys, so... He found a girl who was safe. A girl who could never do anything messy and intimate and loving with him on pain of eternal damnation. And that is what they believe. I looked it up on the church's website. It said, We believe in the universal sinfulness of all men since the fall, rendering man subject to God's wrath and condemnation. We believe in the resurrection of the dead and in the final judgment of the world, the eternal conscious bliss of the righteous and the eternal conscious punishment of the wicked. But here's the thing. Becca wanted to do things with him that were messy and intimate and loving, even at the risk of eternal damnation. And because she couldn't talk to her own parents, she ended up talking to me. I told her I couldn't understand how a loving God would make people only to make them suffer, and that's why I didn't believe in one. And Becca said, you're so wise, Mrs Williams, which is not something anyone's ever called me before or since. And that was her decided. She was going to do the deed with my son. And I thought, this'll be it now. Jane will have to face up to things, tell the truth at last. But I underestimated my son. I underestimated how clever he was and how frightened. Say that again. Look, you always said I can be whatever I want, do whatever I want. I don't know if I said that. You know you have. Except maybe I'm only allowed to do things you agree with. No, I'm not saying that. So what's the problem then? How did this even happen? Well, look, Becca thought it might make things easier if I started going to church. Might make it easier for her folks to, you know, accept us being together. OK. So I went a few times. And first, it was just boring, but the people were really... Really friendly? Yeah. I bet they were, to start. Oh, you think you're so open-minded. Open-minded doesn't mean listening to nonsense. Oh, it's all nonsense, is it? Basically, yes. Because what they believe is what I believe. What? What about what they say makes sense? Like, why the world's such a mess? Why people are so unhappy? Because we've turned away from God. Jamie! Do you know... The world has always, in the last hundred years, always produced enough food to feed everybody. Did you know that? I think I did, yeah. So how come millions of people are starving? Cos of war, poor leadership, the failure of economic no, systems... that's you say it. What the pastor says is God gives us what we need, but he also gives us freedom. And sometimes in our freedom we make bad choices, and our choices are why people suffer. So we're saying the same thing! 
Except I don't need God. No, you think you don't need God. Oh, don't you start with that. Maybe if you had God, you'd get through the weekend with a three-litre box of Pinot Grigio. So you believe all this now? That's what you're telling me? I don't know. I'm saying I don't know. But what they say at church makes sense of things. And so, through a pretty impressive piece of psychic judo, Jamie flipped things round. Now, he was the one so scared of God they had to keep things nice and safe and strictly first base. And now everything I'd ever told Jamie about being his own person, making his own choices, that all came back to bite me on the backside. Because he's made his choice. To believe in a God who sounds like a psychopath. So let me get this straight. I'm a sinner because of something that Adam and Eve did. Look, I'm really tired. I just really want to have something to eat. You, you say just... I don't take an interest. I'm taking an interest. You're starting an argument, and you know you I'm are. I'm not going to argue, I promise. OK. Yeah, OK. I've got revision to do, but no, fine. Yeah, we'll talk about this. Yes, we're all sinners. Right. Well, we are, aren't we? Because some made-up woman in a made-up story ate a fictional apple because an imaginary snake told us oh, See, this is it. This is why it's not worth talking to you. You remember I went on that holiday to Greece and I met that lesbian couple. And one of them had been a lesbian all her life, but the other one had been married to a bloke, had kids. And it was only after all that she looked at herself and went, you know what? And a lot of what she said made sense to me. A lot of it. The look in his eyes. He's just staring right at me now, to show he's not phased or frightened or anything. What if I'd realised that I might be that way? Your God would call me a sinner, wouldn't he? Yes. Yes, he would. He says it without even a heartbeat's hesitation. Because this is what he has to believe. That he can't be what he is because God has told him he mustn't be. Your God will put some of his godlike power into making sure I'm tortured forever and you worship him, the being that would torture your mum. You get a choice. Do I? Come home to God. He loves you. Do you love me? Always. But you worship a being that would torture me forever just because of who I love. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are you gay then? No. So why do you care what happens to them? Because I care more than anything about what happens to you. Look, I'm happy, all right? You always said you just want me to be happy and in the church I am. So why can't you let me be? I look at him. And I think... This is just the beginning. Look, the freedom law protects my client's freedom of expression. It protects her freedom to her beliefs. But how can she be free if, as part of her job, she can be forced to carry out duties she has an absolute moral objection to? Well, maybe she shouldn't have taken a job at an adoption agency if she didn't want to help loving families adopt. In this country, we have a proud tradition of allowing conscientious objectors to be spared military service on moral grounds, and that's at times of war. All we are asking the court to consider is that the principles the freedom law seeks to defend imply we should allow people, all of us, that same right of conscientious objection in all our lives. So no more gay families get to adopt? For that to happen, everyone working for every adoption agency in the country would have to object to gay people adopting. That's never going to happen. And if it did, well, wouldn't that be telling us something? All this stuff about believing in God, I think you're lying. And I can understand you lying to yourself. It's frightening, everything that's going on. But you're lying to Becca as well. You're lying to that poor girl who thinks she's really your girlfriend. I know it's hard for your generation to understand they can be love without sex. That's not but it. In... That's not it, and you know it's not. I know you love her. Of course you do. You love her like a best mate, like a sister. He's looking at me. Begging me not to go on. And she loves you. But she loves you like a woman loves the man she hopes is going to be her husband. And you're never going to be that to her. You tell her the truth. I know you will because I know you because I know you really do love her. And finally, he can't hold my gaze anymore. He looks away. And when he looks back, 
His eyes are wet. You don't! You don't know! Then explain it to me. Make me understand. God, it's not like it was when you were growing up. You can't just be who you want. Things have changed now. I don't think it was ever easy, sweetheart. But it's harder now, isn't it? And I can't lie to him. Yes. Yes, I think it is. There are things that are normal now. Would never been allowed when I was young. I think when I was younger, I was just confused. And Becca gets it. She says it's easy to be led astray when you're little. And she wants kids, and I want kids more than I want anything. Like you said, me and Becca love each other. We could still be a family. Is that fair on her? But what about me? I'm your bloody son. Why don't you care about me? I do! And that's why I want you to tell the truth about yourself and be open and be proud. You could just stop talking about it. Leave it all be and let me and Becca go on as we are. OK. What? If you tell her the truth, if you tell her that you love her like a mate, like a sister, and you think you could raise a wonderful family together, but all you'll ever be is friends who love each other, tell her that, let her make a choice for herself, and if that's the life she chooses, I'll never say another word about it. You know I can't tell her that. Why not? Because the pastor says people like me can never come to God. And Becca believes him. You'd raise a family with someone who hates you. She only hates a bit of me, and I hate that bit of me too. Then what are you going to do? And in the end, he did tell her the truth, or part of it. He told her that he'd lost his faith, that though the pastor said his God was a God of love, what they actually talked about in church was hating and condemning people. And Jamie didn't believe it anymore. You know what? I was still half hoping she might say, yeah, you're right. I don't believe in any of this either. But she didn't. <laughs> she didn't, no. She cried. She cried because she loves me and I'm going to hell. And I didn't even get near telling her about being gay. That was just because of not believing every word that comes out of the pastor's mouth. What? That's the first time I've ever heard you say it, that you're gay. I think it's the first time I've ever heard me say it. Like I said, my son was clever, funny, charming and a handsome bugger. So it didn't take long for him to acquire a boyfriend. In fact, a few. The first three didn't last long enough for me to meet him. But finally, there was one who stuck long enough to meet the mum. And his name was Drew. What did you think? What sort of a name is Drew? Oh, just a normal name. He doesn't like Andrew. What's wrong with Andy? Nothing's wrong with Andy. Drew's just not an Andy at all. And Drew is not an Andy. He's definitely a Drew. And Drew is every mum's nightmare. Drew is stunning, Drew is smooth, Drew is sexy as anything, and my gosh, Drew knows it. My little boy is completely bowled over by Drew. And my little boy is going to get his heart trampled to pieces. <laughs> You're hilarious. On and on and on about how I have to be honest about who I am and what I want. I just don't like him. Oh, we can all tell that. But guess what? I do. And I thought you were going to be proud of me, being who I really am. So did I. Because it's not easy. We can't walk down a street without some idiot shouting at us from a car. You're going to tell me about idiots shouting from cars? Did I forget to mention I'm a woman? Oh, so thanks for the solidarity, Mum. I am proud of you. But tell your face. Is it as bad as that, the shouting? Yes, and... it is. But you knew it would be. Drew might have been an infuriating little sod, but being with him, Jamie was like the cat that got the cream. He wasn't ashamed, he wasn't scared. He was proud. Just not proud in a wholesome, healthy, feeling good about himself sort of way. He was just chuffed a bit, he pulled this amazingly sexy bloke. And that would have to do. And then I'm at the kitchen table doing my makeup. And I hear the front door. 
Year he is, sloping in at half seven in the morning, typical. I hear him taking off his coat, swearing as he tries to get it on an already occupied hook and it falls to the floor. I hear him walk down the hall and it's a steady, measured walk. Not the usual skip step that echoes on the floorboards. And I know. Oh God, this is it. Drew's dumped him. He's going to be in bits. And the steps stop at the kitchen door. Kitchen door opens, opens halfway and stops. Mum? Come on in. Tell me all about it. I just don't want you to panic. Why would I panic? I'm all right, OK? Jamie, why aren't you coming in? Look, say you understand I'm OK. You are starting to panic me now. Will you just... Oh, my God. Look, it's fine. <gasps> I'm fine. He steps past the door and... It's not my son. It's some kid who looks like my son, but it's... One side of his face is all purple and swollen and someone's put fill in his lips and... There's a tooth gone. Blood dried on his neck and his collar and... What the hell happened? We were just walking in the park after the club and these lads, three of them, and they were smaller than me. They didn't even look that hard, you know. They just thought they could have a go. What did you do? But we didn't do anything. They had a go, I told them to F off, and that was it. Except then we were walking out the park and they come at us and they find massive sticks from somewhere and they get Drew and he goes down and it's just me and three of them. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Ah, look, careful, that hurts. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's all right. The hug I can do with, just mind the broken bits. We've got to get you to a &E. I've already been. You've already been? Yes. Amazing, isn't it, that I would do the grown-up thing? Why else do you think I'm coming in at half seven in the morning? Because I've been waiting in casualty for three and a half hours. What'd they say? But it's just bruises, nothing broken, I'll be fine. Really? Yes. Really. He was so brave, so unafraid, and I was properly proud. But things didn't stay like that. The bruises healed... The swelling went down, and with only about a thousand pounds worth of dental work, he stopped looking like an extra from a medieval war reenactment. Drew didn't get off so lightly. Drew had what they thought was concussion, but might be more permanent. It might be physical, it might be psychological, they can't say, but he's not getting better. And when Drew didn't get better, Jamie got angry. He always liked to drink, but he'd drink when he went out. Now we drink at the house, not for fun. It was something like he was punishing himself. And every time I walked home through the park, I'd get so angry, thinking about those vicious little sods. And I get to the point where we turn off the path to take the bridge home to our house and I see a huge office building right next to the path has a CCTV looking over his car park but also looking over the path and I can see it's got those infrared lamps underneath it so we can see in the dark. And I go in and ask, can I speak to whoever's in charge of security? How can I help? Yeah, I'm wondering, um, I see you've got cameras looking over the park. My son got attacked in the past. And you're wondering, did we get it on our CCTV? Let's take a look. The thing is, it was weeks ago. We've got a hard drive the size of a bus. We keep the feed forever. <laughs> and she takes me into the back office and we look up the dates. And there it is. I see my son and his boyfriend getting beaten up by these three little... Oh, they really go for him, don't they? The little cowards. But you can't see their faces. No, you can't. But I used to be in the police, and that image, they could use that. Yes, we do it. You sure? Absolutely sure. I thought he'd need talking into it, but no. Once I explain there's evidence that could help us find the attackers, he's up for it straight away, because the freedom law might have made it OK to say vile things, but you can still get locked up for GBH. 
You know they'll make you go through it all in court. They might bring it all back. I go through it all the time, so... Yeah. That's what I thought. OK. I drive us to the police and Jamie walks in, bold as brass. Marches to the desk and says... Yeah, hello. I'm here to report a crime. And all through the case, he doesn't hesitate. He's going to get justice. And I am so proud of him. It turns out that though the CCTV footage only has a clear shot of one attacker, it's enough for facial recognition software to find a match. A young man called Robbie Hamilton, who lives less than a mile and a half from us. And when the police tell him they've got video showing him committing the offence, he gives up his friends. My clients have pleaded guilty, as of course they should, but I would ask the court to take into consideration the mitigating circumstances surrounding the events of that night. My clients witnessed the victims engaged in sexual activity in a public park. We have footage of that sexual activity caught on CCTV. They play the tape from the same office camera and it shows Drew and Jamie kissing. A long, hard, grown-up kiss between two people who fancy each other something rotten and there's a ripple round the court. One of the jury objects to what he's seeing and the jury's part in proceedings having finished, he is excused. Now, Mr Robbie Hamilton was abused by his stepfather as a child and in the wake of this abuse, he found what he saw that night deeply triggering. Mr Hamilton clearly was the ringleader of the attack, but it is also very clear that Mr Hamilton was not in his right mind. And in that light, I would ask the court to consider the full effect on Mr Hamilton, a working man, a married man, a father of two, of a custodial sentence. And after the footage is shown three times, for reasons that aren't clear to me, the judge clears his throat. I don't believe it. I just... I can't. And on the grounds that they had suffered serious provocation, the judge lets the attackers off with a suspended sentence. The court erupts, hoops and cheers from the public gallery, the boys in the dock hugging each other, high-fiving and... And nine months later, Jamie is back living at home. He has to. He can't find work. Here's the letter. You thought this one went well, didn't you? He's qualified as a teacher. But lots of schools won't take gay teachers now. Not because the head teacher involved is ever prejudiced, you understand. But because of parental concerns. What's it say? It says I was a very impressive candidate and they like me very much, but they don't think I'd be a good fit for them. Oh, sweetheart. What? It's what I was expecting. He's working a coffee shop in the day, a bar at night, he's got two degrees and he's living with his mum. Which I don't mind for a second, of course, but... He's got debts hanging over him from his training. And him and Drew split up. I don't know exactly why. He won't tell me. I need to ask you a favour. You can always ask. No. It's a big one. Look, it's money. I need 6,000 quid. It's to help me get a job, of course. And he hands me a leaflet. It's not a training course. It's a conversion course. A course that guarantees to turn my gay son straight. But you know these courses are nonsense, don't you? They don't work. You can't change what you are. Oh, no, I know that. Then what's the point? If I've been on one of these courses, then I'm legally straight and I can get a job. You do that? I don't have to believe any of it, do I? I just pay the fee, say what they want me to say, and I'm done. I can get a job, get a place. Get out of your hair. I like you in my hair. But what am I going to do, Mum? How am I going to have a life? If you get a certificate saying you're straight now and that's how you get through life... He can't look at me. And then he does. 
I'm sorry, all right? I know. I know. It's all right. I know. Yeah. And I get ready for work, give him a kiss, head out. Get to the end of the street, realise I've forgotten my purse. Turn round, head back, open the door and... There he is. Sitting at the kitchen table. What the hell are you doing? What does it look like? He's sitting there with half a dozen packs of paracetamol. Going through the blister strips. Pushing the pills out into a pasta bowl. What do you think I'm doing? And what am I supposed to do now? Because all I ever wanted was for Jamie to be happy. And now he's so miserable. He doesn't even want to live. You say it's impossible to change someone's sexuality. But there are people who've been on these courses who say they do work. Their lives have been changed. Lives have been saved in some cases. And I'd rather listen to the people who've actually been through it. Thank you very much. The course takes place at a lovely country house hotel, a few miles up the motorway. Jamie doesn't have a car. He can't afford one, so I drive him. It's all very picturesque all very civilised. I drop him off. He gives me a weak little smile getting out the car. I come back at the end of the day to see Jamie shaking hands with a long line of people. Everyone's smiling. Lots of supportive pats on shoulders. They look like a great crowd. How was it? Yeah, it was what you'd expect. Are you okay? <laughs> of course I am. Come on. I want Chinese for tea, my treat. Seriously? Yeah, if you'll let me 20 quid. And then as we're driving home, he goes quiet. I glance over and I see... tears streaming down his cheeks. Love! Look, I can't do it. I can't go back there. They were so vile, Mum. You wouldn't believe. Then you don't have to. I do. I do. How am I going to have a life otherwise? We'll find a way. I, I promise you. <laughs> I promise, my darling. No, you promised me before. You said it would be fine. You said I could just be like this and get married and have a family and all those normal things and it would be fine. <laughs> you promised me when I was tiny. And you lied. I know. I know, and I'm so sorry. I hear him pacing through the kitchen and lounge that night. I try to stay awake till he comes up to his room, but I fall asleep in the end, and when I wake, the place is quiet. And it shouldn't be. There should be music or TV from downstairs or snoring from his room, and there's nothing. Jamie? Jamie? I ring his phone and it goes under his pillow. But other things are missing. A rucksack, a coat, his boots. I check and his Facebook, Insta, all gone. I phone the conversion calls just in case, but he's not there. No one's heard from him. No one I can think of. Ten agonising weeks pass. And then Becca calls. Becca's church do a soup run for the homeless every Wednesday outside the museum. And last night, Jamie was there. She talked to him. He's been living on the streets. He doesn't want to see me. But he'll come and meet Becca again at the church. And after a month, Jamie agrees to move into a spare room in Becca's place. There is still a way out of this for you. What way? You tell the truth about what your mother did to you. But she didn't do anything. <laughs> well, let's have a think about that, shall we? Let's have a, a think about when you were a very little boy and all you knew of the world was what your mum told you. A week after that, he agrees to meet me. Hiya, Mum. He looks like, I don't know, his cousin or someone with the same genes, but someone who's had a completely different life. His hair's gone, it's been buzz cut and that's just growing out. His face has that look you see on loads of homeless people, sunburned, wind-beaten. He barely looks like my Jamie. And he won't look at me. Thank you very much for coming. Of course I've come. I've been worried spare. Yeah, that makes sense. I've been in a bad way. 
Have you seen anybody? Have you seen a doctor? Got yourself checked over? I'm OK now. Now I'm being looked after. Becca's been amazing. You always said you and Becca probably loved each other. Yeah. Sister and brother. Yeah. Until you spoiled it. How do you mean? I understand now. You thought what you were doing was right. And that's why I want to give you the chance to fix things. Of course. Whatever I can. OK, good. Because... I couldn't finish the conversion course. It was just too... The things they were saying... And I told you I'm glad I never wanted you to go on yeah, it. Yeah, but there's another way I can get certified. Certified? Certified is normal. Certified as straight, you mean? <laughs> if I'm normal, I can get a job. I can get a place to live. I can have kids, Mum. I can have a family. Becca said she'll take me back. It's just... You have to help me. What do you want, Jamie? You sit down with the solicitor. Becca's dad will pay... I don't won't... care about money. I care... What am I sitting down with the solicitor for? To confess. To confess that you brainwashed me into thinking I was gay. What? Oh, you know you did. From when I was tiny, you were always telling me it was fine to be that way. It was normal. Because it is! Then why am I on the streets? Because... I know you believe that yourself, but you have to see. We know differently now. You can't indoctrinate a person into being gay. That's nonsense. That's Stone Age stuff. Yes, you can. You can, because you did it to me. Is that what you honestly believe? I look at him, and he still can't quite look at me. And he doesn't quite look like my little boy. But he is. He is. And all any mother wants is for her little boy to be happy. You understand there could be consequences if you admit to activity which is now or becomes, in the future, an offence under the Corruption of Minors Act. I understand. Please state your name, that you are here freely, and why you are here today. My name is Marion Williams. I'm here of my own free will. And I'm here to confess to having indoctrinated my son, Jamie Williams, into gross sexual deviancy. I don't know where to start. And did thou speak in ancient time? Walk upon England's mouth. Freedom was written for radio by Gary Owen. Marion was played by Suzanne Packer, Jamie by Connor Allen. And other parts by Brendan Charlson and Claire Cage. It was a BBC Cymru Wales production, directed by Gilly Adams.